pop my hair. <laughs> you look pretty good, Alex. Fly out, thing. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, most of you people know me. Some of you don't. I, I'm a volunteer scuba diver for Newport Aquarium. So um, part of what we do is from inside the shark tank, interact with visitors that are on the other side of the glass. And uh, then a lot of them want to take photographs and you know, get like both of us in it. So that's what I'm always doing underwater. Hello? <laughs> Okay, are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. We are. We're waiting on you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Has everyone checked in? Not yet, I have. Are you here? I'm here. Come on. I'll get you, Walter. Go ahead. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Alan Miller, the president of SIMPA. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And my hair, my one hair is okay. You just go the other way. Let me just step outside and the wind will take care of that. Um, so don't have much uh, newsy stuff to talk about. Um, I think I explained when we moved, we had to move out of Cincinnati State because things just were not very, the communication was not good there. Um, and so, uh, what's their name? The local Tex. Here? Tanner Yates is with uh, yeah, Tanner Yates, yeah. Blank and I'm Tech Systems. Systems. Tech Systems, thank you. So they're hosting us, they're letting us use this space. Uh, the, the thing about it is they don't control it, they have to submit a request on our behalf. And so we've had it approved for three months through this month. So we put in a request for the next three months uh, and I'm hoping that we'll get to use this again. Uh, if not, we'll be sure and communicate what the new meeting location will be. Um, this, uh, you want to stand up and tell us about June, June please. Yeah, June. This is uh, Jan, he's going to tell us about June. you want to talk into this microphone? Come on, let's go. It takes that way the accent. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it takes the best, best thing to come. Gentlemen, we will have um, a real treat upon uh, next uh, next June uh, June fifth. It will be here. It's uh, your leader in SIM. Um, I know them personally. You also know their product very well. They will be doing uh, as I was before of them. They will be doing a live demonstration um, and connecting not to not to some kind of uh, test environment, the real physical environment. You will see how lags collecting information, how we're analyzing these lags. Um, you know, they, their platform combines user and entity behavior analytics and tools to work in large organizations with cyber security. Should know about this. So uh, uh, we will enjoy it. All of us will enjoy it. It's, it's a great company, great presentation, great people as far as both personalities and ability to present. So we need to spread the work and Come out and that's what will be. You only talk about uh, August as well. Okay, so that's that's what that's what will be doing. Thanks. It's, it's very interesting. Come on, it's interesting. Uh, we'll also uh, one one month after July is uh, the month that we usually go off campus, we do like a social evening. Uh, people bring other people that are willing to put up with a bunch of techies, sometimes with spouses, with parents. Everybody's welcome. It's just real casual, uh, a lot of fun. So anyway, at this point, I'm going to introduce Jeremy Drury. Yes, sir. And he's I have a few diagnostics. And actually, you have your own. I do. In there. I do. So it's it's all yours. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. I think your hair looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I think first thing first, this jacket feels like a little too much uh, at this point. So I'll, I'll take that off. Uh, Really appreciate the, the time to be here with uh, with you all this this evening. Um, you know, I have to I have to ask uh, when it comes to the Internet of Things (IoT). How many of you in your own worlds are using IoT at this point, or experimenting with it, have any sort of runway uh, with with IoT? Anybody at this point? 
Um, you're talking in business world or in, in general? Uh, let's start with business world. The business world, does that still you, Alan, at this point? Oh, yeah. Okay. What about in, in personal? Well, I, I use well, I saw my glass using it. Great. Yeah. I just don't want to make any assumptions. You know, I was actually at a conference earlier this year where uh, a CEO of a pretty sizable business leaned over to me at the table and he's like, literally about two hours ago I learned it, it wasn't IOT. Like, it wasn't <laughs> actually an acronym. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, this is, this is still where we're at, you know, when it comes to uh, Internet of Things. And, uh, you know, I want a couple of uh, added items for everyone in here is I'm not going to talk about IT until the very end, so that way everyone keeps, uh, you know, keeps entertained for the whole time, so, you know, I will talk about all the good stuff there at the, at the very end, uh, assuming that we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and it's important that I actually have a couple of uh, maybe, maybe disclaimers uh, to, to throw out there. One, uh, I'm not an IT professional, I'm not an engineer, um, but before you go and run to the door, I'm also not in sales and marketing, uh, so my, uh, you know, my role, my fit is more around products and how products fit and how you know any type of design gets into how we can actually better use products and, and services uh, around us and and the second piece is that you know even though the title of this is making sense of the internet of things uh, still yet here in may of 2019 i would argue that nobody quite yet can make sense of the internet of things uh, there's, there's, I'm not here to tell you any sort of golden, golden ticket uh, or silver bullet or anything tonight that's going to magically make IoT make all the sense in the world to you and, and all that. But, uh, but more so, I think the reason that I, you know, I typically start in a fashion like that is I'm a big believer in context. And even though I'm not an engineer uh, or not an IT, you know, I believe all of us, regardless of our backgrounds and where we come from, we're all context engineers because uh, we believe that you know context is is the distance between people and the problems, right? So any, we're all problem solvers in here in some capacity, right? And, and the context is all the little nuggets of information and, and sometimes the emotion that gets wrapped in people and the problems. So we come up, you know, whether we're asking for funding or anything like that, we're always talking about the context, the situation, what's going on. Uh, and that's more so what I wanna, what I wanna share with you all tonight. Is so moving from this whole idea of trying to make sense of the Internet of Things, I want to do a good job tonight of establishing some context uh, for us about where the IoT space is at. So IoT Diagnostics, uh, my company, so we've been around uh, since 2017. Uh, however, you know, we're not some Silicon Valley guys in a dorm room that came up with an idea. Uh, we actually spun out of a 50-year-old parent company uh, that does hydraulics and fluid power and automation and all that. Uh, so it's kind of like a pseudo startup, you know, that we get to have all the fun all night and ramen noodles and stuff on the, you know, <laughs> on the evenings and trying to pinch pennies and all that kind of stuff. But, but where we really truly uh, differentiate, uh, I was talking to this gentleman over here that we've, uh, you know, even though we're based in Cincinnati, we already uh, have uh, interest from over 31 countries and this has taken off really quickly. And I think some of the reason that we, that we get into that is because we look at, at full stack IoT. So when I say full stack IoT, what I mean by that is the sensing element, the visualization element, and the analysis element. Uh, so as a company, we do turnkey IoT. Uh, so we're basically providing products uh, or sensor packages, which I'll talk a little bit about. I brought some of them up tonight, which when pizza comes around, I'll pass this stuff around. But in short, like we would build things like this thing called a pump MD here. And I'm not going to make assumptions. I'm not going to go into deep thermodynamics of you know fluid analysis or anything of the sort. But you know what this device does very cost effectively is it would look at pressure, temperature, flow, and efficiency out of an axial piston pump. So axial piston pumps all all over the place in plastics injection molding, foundry, automotive. You know pumps still drive a lot of your modern day manufacturing. Uh, historically. Uh, from all the years from my parent company, uh, you know, solving problems inside the hydraulic space, pumps never go down at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. They always go down at 4 a.m. on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, it just never fits. Uh, that's how it goes. And people just get really pissed off and get burnt out on mm -hmm. getting called in, you know, because the big Mercedes bumper line is down, you know, for the next six hours. And, you know, so all this stuff always gets back into downtime, eliminating downtime, creating uptime, right? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as well. 
But before I, I take us down and just you know get into some use cases on some other companies that we're working with and everything, uh, I want to go a little dark first. Uh, and what I mean by that is I get, to be honest with you guys, I get really pissed off when I go to conferences. Uh, I speak at a couple different conferences, and I was actually just speaking at the Automate conference in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and giving a kind of basics of Industry 4.0, IoT, uh, or the kind of how a how-to class. And literally in the room right next to me is the president of Universal Robotics doing a session on Industry 5.0. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, <laughs> you know, when, and fortunately, I, got, I actually ended up having more attendees in mind, thank goodness, because I was worried about the poison that was going to be spun out of the, the session across the way, because that's, I feel like that's why we've gotten this big quagmire at this point, is, you know, when I think IoT, people are struggling with IoT stuff. I mean, I, you know, we have partners that were technically doing IoT in like 2004 or 2005. I mean, the whole idea of having a device talking to another device or pushing information to the internet to get uh, to get visualization of it. It's not new. Sensors aren't new. Sensors have been around for decades at this point. Why are we still struggling with all this stuff? And I think, you know, that uh, uh, some of what we see is that, you know, maybe five, six, seven years ago, uh, never would have put these together, but apparently some savvy European marketers in Germany, et cetera, had this vision, right, of I'm gonna connect we see what's kind of happening in the consumer space, and we think we can do the same in the, in the manufacturing industrial space. So we're gonna we're gonna cast out this vision that, in short order, we're gonna have everything be connected, and we're gonna get all this information out of it. And it's gonna learn itself, and all this downtime is gonna be eliminated. All this new money is gonna be created, and CEOs just love that shit, guys. I mean, they just they eat it up, right? So now you've got a bunch of these CEOs from all over the world coming in and saying, oh, "I want that." I want that. So they cast this vision way out there, and all these CEOs come around and they say, you know, well, we're we're in on that. But the problem is, is you know, what we always argue, we argue two main points in our company is guess what day of the week doesn't make you any money? Tomorrow. Um, you make all your money today. Um, and you know, and it's just like that, that but it's so funny that we get so caught up in being, you know, the CEOs out there. And the second one would be that Ideation costs nothing, execution costs everything. And oftentimes, the leaders of these companies, I get pointed into that sometimes myself, we get pointed into this kind of vision, hunger, and then we say, okay, we want to be out here, go figure it out. Go figure it out. And then there's all sorts of just a, you know, a mess, a labyrinth to try to figure everything out. So what's happened, especially in the industrial space, is some people have kind of forgot who their customers were in the industrial space. And the actual users on the shop floors and everything like that, they pride themselves on optimization. I mean, they've spent years of studies, black belts, all that to take nickels and dimes and pennies out of processes, and suddenly now I'm like, let's radically change how you do everything. Nope. You know, like that's just not that's just not gonna fly. It doesn't work that way. So so unfortunately there's this there's this big chasm created where like the future's out there, where all the cool stuff is, and a misperception of that like very very, some of the most skeptical people I know are in the fluid power hydraulic industrial space. And they say, I don't buy it. If you don't create for me a clear bridge to get there, I don't buy it. So then, unfortunately, so again, they're, they're still so caught up on their future vision. Uh, I'll, I'll walk back over there in a second. Uh, I got long legs too, so. Uh, but so again, they're so caught up in the space over here, they're like, okay, well, how do we get back over this way? So they start coming out with all this sort of, uh, ecosystem kind of stuff. So you start hearing things about 5G and all this really cool technology that's coming out. But even if I start building a bridge back this way to the customer, you know who's still not moving in that equation? The customer. They're still not going anywhere, right? So now just more money's being spent for little action to happen here. So we, you know, we really encourage that, you know, that the companies that are truly winning in the industrial IoT space are those that are actually jumping in like pockets of optimization, looking to solve specific problems on the shop floor, pumps, presses, fluids, filters, vibration, all that kind of stuff that actually matter to the people that are using it before we get into the whole enterprise, changing culture, globalization of, of data. And I think people are finally, uh, the bigger companies are finally starting to uh, get it, get into and get in stuff with that, uh, which, is, which is really good. Um, you know, we always say that, that frankly IoT doesn't have to be intimidating, as long as we have good context of where we're at. So in all of our studies and all of that, we, have, we believe that the industry is kind of in this, uh, this proof phase, right? So 
estimation that this phase will last anywhere from 2017 to 2022 to 2023. You know, that I think the hype, the hype cycle has started to dissipate a little bit. I think there was just a recent study coming out of uh, Hanover, Mesa, the big Hanover Fair in, in Germany that has all of people's latest technologies. And IoT was like down 40% as a hot topic, you know, uh, that has been replaced by all this other stuff here. So the hype cycle, I think people get it and they understand what it can do. And now we're in this really tricky spot of, okay, prove that to me. Uh, so this is where all the sensor providers, the cloud people, the visualization, the platform companies, all that. Uh, this is the make or break for us right here. Can we actually do what we say that we can do? And then we get into all this stuff down here that Frank Bonnie won't talk about at this point. Because uh, it's not working. It's not working together. The reality is, is when we think about Industry 4.0, that Industry 4, the period of, the true period of Industry 4.0 won't be defined until 50, 60 years from now where some historian is going to look back and say, you know what, I actually think Industry 4.0 happened between this, this decade and this decade. You know, we get so wrapped up right now, like, are we there, are we in it, are we not? Probably not. You know, I would say we struggle still with, like, Industry 3.47, 3.5, uh, which is just basic kind of automation, you know, getting some automated processes in there. Uh, but, you know, we actually really enjoy this improvement phase because, um, Regardless of how you feel about capitalism, uh, the free market, a lot of new entrants always happen in this space, and uh, especially on the platform side. I think you go to any sort of trade shows or anything like that, every, everybody's got the shiny new dashboard. Let me show you the sexy way to look at your industrial data. Uh, and and, it, and it's, it's painful, you know, because the reality is it's like, just because you can tap into a local PLC and pull some information out of it and put it on a dashboard, Good luck on the differentiation train when the Boshes of the world and the Parkers of the world and the Siemens and the Rockwells will mow you over. Uh, so you're going to have, you know, and that's the, that's the rub with, with companies like that. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to get into a little bit more on the proof of phase here, which gets really tricky because on such a data-driven initiative, it's really hard to find good ROI data from companies that are actually successfully deploying IoT. Uh, so the way that, you know, because Companies like Gartner, they love phases like this, you know, because then they can throw out all their big industry statistics that people pay tons of money, you know, to have them come along, uh, come along with them. But, but so we've had to modify the whole idea of what is ROI for something like this. You know, that it's the difference kind of getting in the, the hybrid between hard and soft ROI. We all know what hard ROI is, especially to get to the industrial space. It's mean time before failures, you know, mean time to repair, all those things that you can actually put some dollar value to, or it's not there yet on the IoT side, which I'll get a little bit more into. Where a lot of the IoT ROI is right now is knowledge transfers, training, setting clear baselines. You know, some of the projects that I'll talk about in here is, you know, we were looking at filtration monitoring to target very specific filters, only to find out that their whole baseline filtration practice was incorrect. Because at some point, some new guy comes in who's been trained by the old dog, who knew all sorts of tricks of the trade and everything like that, but at what point does that new person ever want to come in and say, you know what, I don't think you're doing that right. I wouldn't, you know, so it's just easier and better just to get in line, you know, and say, okay, thank you. I will do exactly how you say to do that, and I'll, I'll move on from there. But now when you get into the, the data side, you can really start to call out uh, what's, what's true and, and what's not. So beyond just what my voice is saying, I just want to throw some other interesting perspectives that I see out here. Uh, you know, we have a good partnership with Bosch, uh, and Bosch, just like other companies, you know, the reality is, is that in this movement, everything that can be connected will be connected. Everything that can be digitized will be digitized. Uh, even down to the silly levels, uh, you know, we hear all sorts of, I, the, the one that always cracks me up, actually at the Bosch facility, which I gave them a hard time about this, I ordered a cup of coffee from a mirror. And I'm just like, what a, what a, what a useless application of IoT. Like, they had this, this mirror that they were trying to deploy basically high-end condos and apartments, you know, so I walked into the mirror and there's a really expensive oh, I, I thought you were talking about an arrow person. Oh, no, 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 a mirror. Yeah, a mirror, like a, like a look, yeah, yeah. So look at myself in the mirror. So in this smart mirror, there's a really expensive, you know, espresso maker over there, and I can literally, like, select 
select what coffee that I wanted to. And it's just like, you know, coffee for me has always been like a what do I feel like decision, not like a what do I look like decision. You know, like walking up into it and you're like, man, whoo! You know, it's going to be like a free shot day for me, apparently. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just like, ah, oh, that's, that's a terrible use of IBT. So what? Uh, I think my most, the favorite quote I've read so far this year is the brilliant minds at Oxford and Yale have come together to say, we will write the general AI in the next 20 to 200 years. <laughs> Woo! I want that job. <laughs> I wonder if some like, meteorologist subbed in for them one day. They're just like, ah! Cloudy with a chance of AI in the next 200 years. So. Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, we know automation is going to continue to have a big impact on the job market. A couple of quick takeaways on this one. Um, I actually just want to focus on this one here in the middle. The other one's pretty self explanatory because we actually run into this a lot. Uh, so we've got about 15 multi-billion dollar global companies that we work with at the end of the day. And we come up against this question a lot of, you know, in the very, again, startup economy of the, of the U.S. and around the world, you know, you've got these hundred year old, you know, robust, slow moving ships. And suddenly you're in there talking to them about their long term data strategy and the, the infrastructure that you're trying to create for them. And they're like, like and you're VC funded? We're not VC funded, but they look at some of these other startups and like, how, how do you know you're going to be around in five years? Like, you're asking us to invest all this money into the solution that you're developing for us, and we don't know. And so all the machine learning and all that stuff, I mean, all the time and the hours that come from that, if that company evaporates or gets purchased by a competitor or something like that, it becomes a mess for those companies to deal with. You know, so we have a couple of partners uh, that are incredibly talented uh, that are in our, our atmosphere that, you know, as much as we love their technology, we've come into some of these companies and they say, you know what, we love it too, but you can't, you can't bring them along with you. You've got to do this alone because we don't trust that they're going to be around. Uh, and that's just, that's tough, tough stuff to consider um, when it comes to, when it comes to this space. So again, you know, a lot of times when I think about IoT, it literally seems a lot like this. It's, you know, I think sometimes the industry's not moving because the reality is we don't quite know where we're going yet. Because I think sometimes, especially when I talk to executives, they, they love to talk about the concept of data, but like one follow-up question and it was toast uh, at that point. You know, they always take the, uh, my favorite is like, there's always one executive in every meeting that takes like the Mr. Burns from the Simpsons approach and says, we want to own the data. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, do you even know what that means? Like, what, like, what do you actually mean when you say that? You know, I don't know, I just want it all. And you're just like, <laughs> like oh, well, I, don't, I don't know if that's gonna work out for you. But, so we, we take a lot of our time educating our customers and our partners around how to simplify the whole concept of, of data. And it really stuck out to me. I was invited down to, uh, meet with the president, one of their top people at a, a massive sensor company in Northern Kentucky. And you know, we were, they were torn through the plan. I mean, the company's been around for a long time, global footprint. And you know, so we go into a conference room and they bring in their head of IoT. And, uh, and we're talking and they're grilling me about like everything that we're up to and what we're doing and all that. And I was like, so what about, what about you guys? And again, sensor, uh, sensor manufacturing uh, company and the guy was just like, with this extreme bravado, he's just like, we make data. And I was just like, whoo! Your marketing person deserves a raise. I mean, that's like t shirt, like coffee cup, you know, like that's, that's strong. But, I, you know, but I, I couldn't help but leave that, that meeting thinking, like, man, you guys have such a runway here, and you're like literally stopping at the first exit when it comes to what data actually means for the company. Because when we think about data, we actually think about it in eight kind of eight step roadmap, right? Where step one is sure, you know, making the data. So that's sensors, link masters, we get an IO link and all that kind of stuff, the actual hardware. And then you actually have to move that data, right? So just because you have a dumb sensor, you gotta figure out how to move that. So that's through gateways, data acquisition devices, you know, even getting into the, the routers. So we're still in the hardware space, but some companies, you know, I think of like HMS uh, over in Europe, HMS crushes this space. So they just focus on this lane and are really, really good at it. Just involve moving data. And then where everyone loves to play right now is the whole viewing data. Uh, so it gets into the interfaces and all that, how the APIs, how the you know, information moves back and forth. Um, not enough people will talk about this one. It's kind of the, uh, oh my God, yeah, security. Um, well, which we're trying to advocate against, but uh, you know, there's plenty of companies out there that get into how to secure the data uh, and everything like that. Then you go on the other side of the fence and I will 
camp out on the whole use data for at least the next 30 to 30 minutes or so. Because uh, then you get into how do I actually use the data, right? Uh, so just because a sensor tells me something, what does that actually mean for me? Which I'll, I'll spend quite a bit more time talking about that. So you, you learn how to use the data. And you got to learn how to use the data before you scale it. And there's good companies out there that can help scale, you know, do enterprise level data. And then you get into the sharing data, which again, you know, the true vision of IoT is a more harmonious ecosystem, whether it's secured by blockchain or whatever that may be, where vendors, OEMs, end users, everyone is, is, is the whole feedback loop has been flattened. You know, so they're all, it's, it's more seamless in how support, how products are delivered and everything like that. And then ultimately, again, where, where the, we erroneously cast the vision too soon is how to analyze big data, you know? And we all think, guys, I don't know how many times I sit in front of companies and they're like, well, what can you do to predict my failure today? Nothing, nothing. I can, I can set you up with some sensors and we can start a data flywheel. And when I get about a million machine hours, then I will feel confident enough to predict a failure for you at this point, but nothing sooner. Not on my, not on my watch. If you want to, if you want to create some failure states for yourself, go for it. But I, I won't bet my company on shutting down your system on a, on a failure mode with just a couple of hours of, of runtime data. Okay. So you know when I talk to a lot of companies that are trying to figure out this equation out there, uh, I look at it typically like this, where you know again, not a knock on anything on this left side of the screen. But for, for me, those are enablers, right? You know, just by putting a sensor on a piece of business or on, on a piece of equipment, like you're basically enabling the next step. And it's really when you get on the other side of that bridge, the whole movement from, you know, you've collected all the data and you put it somewhere, how do I use it? And that's when you get to the true value and you can begin to integrate uh, with your customer. Thank you. That's super important. Yep. Um, okay, yeah, because that, that there gets us out of the so what question. Uh, we had a, a heck of an interrogation with a big company uh, some months ago where, you know, the, the question was, so what? You know, so the way that we, one of the easiest examples that I talk about, again, I'm going to try not to get too deep into the fluid power hydraulic space, but in common filtration, we all know how filters work, uh, you can get mechanical indicators basically on these filters. They're like a little turkey baster that says, okay, when you've had enough particulate or your differential pressure inside that filter has reached its capacity and it needs to change, beep, this little mechanical ind indicator says, hey, change it, okay? If I go and put a thousand dollar sensor that does the same exact thing, you know who doesn't win in that equation? That person who just spent a thousand dollars instead of, you know, a ten dollar little turkey baster that just gives them a mechanical indication because at the end of the day, people are still walking around their shop floors and they still look for those mechanical turkey basters to say, okay, I need to change that, I need to do this, I need to do that. Just by putting sensors on there, I'm not moving the ball down the field for them whatsoever. It's how we get and actually use that filtration data to then create for them uh, reordering algorithms, how we actually do the machine learning calculation, like to get into efficiencies, because there's all these big filtration filter companies out there, Hydac, Paul, you know, and they're making this money, and they come out there and they say, you should use my filter because of this. Well now, with sensors, we can actually say, oh, okay, we can track trends and see if you actually mean what you say you do. Uh, it's more empowering for the, the people on the shop floor. So that's the, that's the pivot. Uh, and ultimately, I don't tee this up to get us all hungry before the, the pizza gets here, uh, but we always camp out on how are you layering the sensor data, sensor data together, right? So again, back to the whole, like, we make data. Well, that company sells one-off sensors. And they do such a good job of it. Temperature sensors, vibration sensors, all that kind of stuff. But as a standalone, because we always say the same thing with, a, you know, there's a lot of companies that just still rely so much on vibration, which vibration profile, the oscillations, the sound waves, they give you a lot of good information. But they'll be like, well, I want to put a vibration sensor on this. And I'm like, okay, is that it? You, that's not going to give you any context for what's going on. Right? It's probably, because if this thing starts to change its vibration profile, there's a good thing, it's probably the motor over here. So you don't want to monitor the motor, you want to, the gearbox over here is more important for you because you just bought it. So that's what you want to put the sensor package on. But, but that's, not, that's not right. You need, what's the other information that's actually telling you the better picture and telling you the better story? And, and that becomes the, the true challenge of where we're at with the IoT space right now, right? Is, is that I think largely they understand that and then they say, well, that starts to get expensive. Uh, you know, that at what point do I want to, you know, 
invest enough in the right context to get the better story. Or we have some companies that you know go completely bonkers and they want to measure everything. Uh, you know, one person he wanted to do vibration level sensing just as a quick aside here, and this is how quickly uh, the IoT can can scale itself out, right? So a big company in the area, German German parent, and you know, when it comes to typically in your data, which I'm sure almost everyone in here is, is, is pretty familiar with, but typically there's a couple of cost streams associated with, with your data infrastructure on the software side. There's going to be some annual hosting uh, fee. There's going to be some per device per month, you know, moving actually the packets of data back and forth. Uh, and then if you're going cellular or any type of, you know, mobile or anything like that. Um, most of those in and of itself isn't very expensive because most of those oftentimes are pushing data once a minute, sometimes once an hour, or once 20 minutes or something like that. Now we, we exist in the kind of uptime critical environment, so a lot of our stuff is doing a pretty healthy data churn. Well, this guy's like, no, I don't, I don't want to do, my company's after big data. I don't want to do vibration once a minute. I want to do 25 kilohertz. I want to get down into every oscillation of vibration and I want 60,000 of these sensors throughout my facility. I'm like, do you know how expensive that's going to be? He's like, it can't be that much. And like, even trying to cut him a deal, just based on what our cost would have been to do that, he would have went literally from 30 bucks a month to 47,000 bucks a month by, by doing what he wanted to do. And he's like, how, you know, so, you know, so it gets into like, because he wanted to store it for a couple of years and all that kind of stuff. So just that, that really intense and terror, you know, that, that consulting you have to do with it. So he was like, okay, well, now I get why, you know, it makes more sense to maybe batch my vibration data once a minute and send, send averages up and out when it comes to that. So yeah, so that's where, you know, we, we really bake into uh, to this philosophy. Again, I said, you know, our, our core, even though we get into the visualization and the analysis, uh, you don't get there unless you have really good sensing products. So we, again, focus on very specific industrial use cases. So I talked a little bit about the Pump MD, which is sitting over there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the Filter RX. So that's the thing that's getting in there and telling you all sorts of information about the filtration practices. Uh, we do 16 levels of fluid sensing. I uh, actually had just did a big installation up at a nuclear facility uh, just last week, uh, which was a pretty cool product. Um, yeah, and then we also do basic data acquisition. So, you know, your typical uh, DAQ device like this, which basically like this little contraption here would uh, accept any 0 to 10, 4 to 20, 0 to 24 digital signal. Uh, this is like a proof of conceptor's dream. So there's one automotive company that we're dealing with, and he's convinced that the humidity in the summer drastically affects his production at the asset on the shop floor, and his boss doesn't believe it. Well now, guess what? You can API the local weather, you can put a humidity sensor on the roof and the ceiling down at the asset and watch the measured change of moisture down to your asset. There's going to be one winner and one loser as that, uh, after that gets installed this summer, right? Either boss man's going to say, I told you so, or the other person's going to be like, dude, this is happening, I told you. Uh, so that's exactly what these, uh, these type of devices are, are used for. And then we get borderline into robotics with our e-stat, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the, some of the specific use cases. Uh, and the only reason I say borderline robotics is in the true definition of robotics is when something absorbs some information and takes an action all on its own. Right? So your traditional IoT is just, it tells you you have cavities. Right? So then the e-stat is actually a device that gets into electrostatics. I'm not going to go into the deep around electrostatics, but basically it deploys electrostatics and super cleans fluid. Uh, so fluid is really dirty in these kind of uh, industrial places, and that puts uh, electric charge through the fluid to actually clean it um, based on the information that it's pulling in. So, uh, then like I mentioned, I think I mentioned, uh, actually just a couple weeks ago, we were up at a trade show called Reliable Plant up in Cleveland. We built this monstrosity that, you know, just wouldn't fit on top of my car to bring down here to, uh, to walk you all through it. It's about 10 and a half feet tall, uh, weighs about 1,500 pounds. Somehow we have to get this in an elevator up to the 21st story up at, uh, for that Milwaukee show that we're going to be at that I was telling you about. So it's a share in the revolving restaurant or the revolving hotel at the top there. Uh, but the reason that we do this is again to basically show through all of the analysis up here how all of this actually is connected together. When you have a fluid issue, how it affects your filters, your pumps, your valves, and then how to actually do read the information, do something about it. Uh, and, and go from there to the point of like it's kitschy, but it's for a trade show and all that. That you know, there's actually hydraulic fluid in here, and when there's an issue, the LEDs glow red. You know, just to say like, hey, 
you have an issue in your fluid, and let's, let's do something about it. Okay, so I am now going to do a, a pretty hard pivot into actual use cases. Which, by the way, if you guys have questions as I go on, please, uh, please feel free to do that. My question is, do you have any type of kind of user interface which can centralize interface if, let's say, your customer has X number of these or similar devices? Uh, you can collect the uh, data from each of these devices, right? Yes. Do you have central point or software uh, with graphic or any kind of interface? But yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting enough, we've actually had to pivot now three times to basically kind of, this is some irony here, we've had to pivot three times to do a one-size-fits-all approach, uh, which I'll, I'll come back to at the very end, because we, we went to market with one really strong partner when it comes to like visualization and analysis and pulling all the data together, uh, and then we brushed up against their limitation once one big customer was like, can they do this? So we can't. Okay, we'll go find the next the next partner and pull them in. Uh, then we you know we were there, and then ultimately where we're going now is you know in addition to those really two strong companies, uh, we're going to be an Azure Microsoft Azure specific vendor before the end of the year. Uh, we've got four companies that we're working with that like it is an absolute mandate that Azure. Uh, it's pretty much uh, if you've been paying attention, both Google and IBM has kind of waved the flag. Uh, wave the white flag to uh, Amazon AWS and Microsoft Azure, who's winning the cloud, kind of cloud level IoT side of things. So now even your Google baseline has software that allow you to send data to Azure through Google. IBM is doing the same. So it's going to be this kind of AWS, Microsoft, you know, and actually there was an article on Medium just this week that says, you know, Microsoft should just give up now because nobody beats Amazon uh, like when it comes to that. So, so but, but the irony is, Jan, is that you know we started we started with AWS in, in three years. Now we do AWS, Google, and Azure cloud experiences on how we actually pull and route the data. Um, yeah, which makes it pretty challenging. But again, it's one of the benefits of us being more on the smaller nimble side is we can we can pivot a lot more with what the customers are looking for. Okay, so I want to talk to you guys again. I'm going to try really hard not to get deep into the weeds, fortunately, because I, I can't get into the weeds. Uh, we've got in, we have really strong engineers and maintenance techs on our on our staff. So uh, I want to go through a couple of different maintenance problems that we come up against and how we're using IoT to solve those in the industrial space. The first one, which is probably the most common for us, is the whole, "Hey, person, you're the problem." You know, we don't say it quite like that, but it's, it's your maintenance practices that, that is your maintenance problem. You know, if they call us, like, what's going on? Everything's breaking down. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so this will be an interesting one, the one that uh, I think makes the most sense. So we came in to uh, to this company, again, big, uh, big global company, I think 10, 15 billion uh, or so, and they were, we had gotten an earshot, they were literally about to throw away $100,000 worth of fluid because it just was not working for them. Uh, so they do a lot of military military work and again fluid uh, you know you, you think fluid just kind of like enters into a plant and it's used and it's fine. The fluid just gets thrashed all throughout the plant because through things like uh, just like us when we get stressed out all sorts of stuff starts to go wrong on us right. It's really no different with the fluid. You get excess heat, uh, shears, electricity, all sorts of stuff can just create a mess of fluid to the point where I actually have a couple of physical examples that I will, uh, that I'll show you, uh, that can show you just how bad it can get. But anyway, this person was so fed up that they were about to dump $100,000 worth of their fluid. And we said, no, 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 don't do that. We have a system that can actually make that back to servo quality for you. What I mean servo quality is basically just like high, high premium level of fluid quality, okay? And he says, sure, sounds like snake oil, right? And this is where IoT in a very practical way can actually make a lot of sense and help out these customers. We can say, okay, well, we can actually prove it to you. You know, so we'll, we'll set up a data interface, visualization tool, and actually watch you, watch your fluid get more clean, okay? So he said, you know what, I'm in. Let's, let's try this thing, okay? So we, we on this, on this system, we look at the ISO particles or the micron levels of the fluid, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll geek out for three seconds here. So microns are, a human hair is 40 micron, okay? 
we're down and we look at like 10, 15 micron level particles in the fluid. Because even those, are yeah. You, are you looking at high viscosity of the fluids? Yeah. All, all sorts of viscosity fluids, to be honest with you. Uh, but high, it's high viscosity as well. Um, you know, but there's, so there's all sorts of stuff that, you know, gets into the fluid. And what happens is, is the fluid, when it, when it heats up, it creates what's called varnish. Uh, so varnish basically gets into the insoluble varnish, so it's actually the particles that are floating in the fluid, and then those ultimately actually get stuck to the substrates of all the equipment. So all this gunk gets caught inside the, the pipes and all this kind of stuff. And, and ultimately what happens is you get companies out there that go, hey, let me change your oil for you. And they'll pay 10,000 bucks as a service once a month to like, clean, you know, get the oil out of there and change it. And what happens is, is okay, so you get that dirty oil out of there, but you know what doesn't get taken out? The varnish that's all along the inside of all the crap. So they put the new oil in there and it's immediately crappy again within no time at all. It's like, it sounds like high cholesterol. That, <laughs> it sounds like high cholesterol. Yeah, it's basically high cholesterol, which is why these machines fail so often and so quickly, right? So the, the, the yeast that actually gets in there and not only through, again, the electrostatics, it pulls the insoluble varnish out, but then it actually can remove the varnish from the substrates of the, of the equipment. So it was cool. Uh, and I'll actually come back to this in a little bit to show you a bit more. But needless to say, we came in and we did what we said we were going to do. We took his micron levels, which were dangerously high, like 19, 18, 17 from a particle count, and we took it to a 10, 8, 7. Server quality is 9, 8, 7. He was like, holy cow, I'm in. What else can you guys do for me? We're like, well, we're glad you asked. Uh, so immediately we were like, hey, how's your filtration coming? He's like, ah, oh, my filtration sucks. So we were like, okay, well, we can monitor that. So then we got in there uh, and we started looking at differential pressure and particles in his filters. And then this was the case example that I was telling you about. He was literally like a kid on Christmas because he was wondering why every time he put a new filter in, that mechanical indicator popped immediately. And they were just like, I don't know what's going on, so I'm just not going to worry about it. Isn't that like terrible advice? You know, <laughs> like, I don't understand it, so I'm just going to go in la la land and just pretend that nothing is happening. It's like it's like an adolescent's way of like, dealing with things, right? Uh, it's too big. I don't want to deal with it. And uh, you know, and, and you'd be surprised how often that happens. We actually uh, know a customer who had was having such filtration issues with those mechanical indicators that he was so tired of them going off all the time that he was he turned them off. He turned off the function. And he said, you know what, I just don't want to care about it anymore. Million dollars is what it cost. Because one of those filters blew and everything that was getting taken up behind that filter went down and jacked up the big system and everything like that. I don't know if he works at that company anymore. But, uh, but needless to say, we had discovered that their baseline filtration prep, their whole filter housing was incorrectly sized. So all the way from engineering all the way to the shop floor, it was destined to fail from the beginning. Uh, and that is glorious information for them because now they have a better baseline understanding. Before we actually even care to get into the, the, the interesting aspects of the filter, they started on an unstable floor. And this is what IoT was able to do for them. And he says, awesome, I love you guys. So yeah, they're turning at 33% savings so far on their filtration practice. And then they decide to swing out of the park and they say, hey, Germany just gave us a corporate-wide ISO 50001 energy standard that we're going to have to pony up to. Again, being a European-based company, energy is gold. Energy is always top of mind. You know, oftentimes, I mean, you know, energy feels like such a free, you know, valuable, not so valuable resource for us here. But Germany's doing it. Whole global companies got to do it. So then, literally, they've got a we're a six-person company. Six six-person company, and we're now helping them out on a global energy initiative via IoT. How to how to observe all that data and what that actually means for them. Um, again, with Germany and Europe being kind of a hotbed of IoT, that, that one of the good things that IoT can do is escalate solving problems. You know, if you can start something small, you can quickly escalate and show, here's all this other stuff that once you're in, uh, you know, we believe it's easier to go from three to four than it is to go from zero to one. So once you're in there, you can very quickly start to escalate and show a lot of value for, uh, for the customer. Uh, so the nuclear application that I was telling you about, you know, the irony when you come into like steam and steam turbines and everything like that, surprise, surprise, low level moisture leaks are a pain in the rear for steam turbines. So, you know, you need, you need moisture, but the moisture is a problem, right? Uh, so this specific, uh, specific nuclear company, every time their steam turbine goes down, it costs them a million bucks. Every time. Now, we actually, we love PowerGen and nuclear because they're the ones that have all the money to spend. 
You know, typically your plastics injection molders, they don't have any, like, it's like, I need something for like 200 bucks. PowerGen's like, PowerGen's like, take my money. If you can solve my problem, I don't care. Take it, take it, take it. And they said they would have literally paid anything for us to come in and measure moisture for them. And we said, well, I think we can do one better. So we brought in our, our big fluid analysis system. So our fluid analysis system looks at everything from water to humidity, viscosity, particles, wear metals, into the actual fluid chemistry to getting into the permittivity and conductivity of the fluid, real high science stuff uh, that, that people pay a lot of money for consultants around the world on what they actually know about what's going on in the fluid. Uh, and we were able to show it to them in real time. And that, you know, and that's for them, you know, after we did this installation last week, they threw a big celebration because we got this up and running in nine months. Now, us in pseudo startup land, we're just like, nine months is forever. They had not had a turnkey project happen in less than two years, ever. And then we were able to come in in nine months and say, hey, here you go, here's some, here's some stuff. And what really stuck out to them on this is some of this IoT stuff actually can make really high science become just a lot more practical. So one of the interesting things, when you start to layer the information together, we've actually landed on and discovered an, an evaporation curve which is right in the wheelhouse of what they were looking at. Just by doing water saturation, it just tells them the level of moisture. But by layering these strategically uh, sensor information on top of each other, you can actually start to see a trend in evaporation. So now, based on certain operating parameters, you can adjust what that evaporation curve looks like. So if moisture is their problem, they know based on the weather data, based on the shop environment data, based on what's going on in the fluid, they can actually make those adjustments real time to eliminate the moisture out of the fluid. Where historically, you know, they've got to hire a certified lubrication specialist at probably 800 bucks an hour, who's gonna come in and take them to school and everyone's gonna get their hair blown back and be like, I don't know what you said, but it's really cool. I don't know, but I just trust you, so here's my money, take it and run with it. And now, they can actually just look at that themselves and make some good inferences and make some adjustments on the fly. So, uh, really, really strong win there for them. So coming back now to uh, still kind of camping out on fluid quality. So remember what I was talking about, actual like fluid samples. So these up here are legit actual pictures of fluid samples. So here's what oftentimes a lot of hydraulic oil, uh, water light bulbs, all that stuff looks like. It's pretty clear to begin with. Uh, there's a big global services company here in Cincinnati. I won't mention them by name because the story is relatively embarrassing. Uh, but they were having all sorts of failures. I mean, they were just like bludgeoned by failure from day to day. So we came in and said, hey, I think we can help. And we took an actual oil sample, and that was what the oil looked like. Yeah. So we sent it off to a laboratory and literally got congratulated because they'd never seen oil that nasty in their entire lives, in like the 70 years that they had been around doing lab analysis. Uh, as if pretty much someone at that company just said, oil's not a concern to us, or fluid's not a concern to us, we're going to let it go. And wouldn't you know it, we actually ran the stat and made the oil look like this in about 16 days after that. But there's an interesting lesson to this story, uh, and I can't, I can't do the visualization anymore, unfortunately. Um, but, so this was actually, as a confession, this was done about four years ago, okay? This was before IoT Diagnostics was a company. This was before IoT was even a part of it. Uh, so the East was a product that we basically iot We put a sensing package on there. And I spoke at TechSolve uh, earlier this year and Mike Hoskins is our head of filtration uh, at, at our company. He actually ran this project. And I asked him, like, hey, do you have your field notes from that? And he said, and he dug for him and he found him. And I was like, you trust me? And he's like, I, I think so. And so he was, you know, we went and I spoke at this TechSol event. And as I was giving this example, I took his field notes on a ripping the dress right from the bike, still on the floor. And he was like, hey, I didn't expect that. And, uh, and, and, and the reason I did that is because the data narrative is so much more sticky than what we've done historically. Because the reality is, even though the proof was in the pudding for them, because there was no data attached to it, you know what never, never happened? We just did that and we were never invited back in. The guy left. The guy who actually sponsored this project for us, he left. So along with him, we may as well just shredded all those really important field notes about this record-changing fluid cleanliness that we did there because it didn't need squat. Because we didn't have anything attached to it, you know? So it was no different if a guy or a gal, you know, files a paper along. I mean, how many times, you know, anytime we get a piece of paper, I mean, bin 13, you know, over here in the stack, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was a bummer, right? Because that was a really impressive thing. So this is how this escalates now. So now let's uh, flash forward. This is about two years ago. And we had a plastics injection molding company 
Uh, similar issues, all sorts of problems, and we brought in the stack. We actually had data associated with it this time. And so they brought us in, and we were starting to, and apologies, it's a little small, but uh, so we activated the stack for them, and they and started to see it. They started to see the immediate downward trend. And they were like, oh my gosh, this thing is magic. What is going on? Until about two days later, the particles went back up. And they're like, get this thing out of here, you liars. This doesn't work. You know, our particles are right back up. And it was a great opportunity to sit down and educate the customer and say, hey, remember when we talked about how you get the insoluble varnish out first, and then all the stuff on the substrates starts to come out? Well, that's getting inside your fluid in order to get out. So that's why you're going to see that secondary hill, because that's all this new varnish coming off your substrate. So that means it's actually working even better, because now it's pulling the crap off of your substrates. So then sure enough, you know, it starts to come down, and then apologize, it's got a little cut off, but sure enough, got them down to about 1087, 987 afterwards, and they, and they loved it. So again, very similar, I told you about the, uh, the other company up here that we were showing uh, earlier as well, got down to the, the 987. So we really, yeah. Um, this is compared to the business devices. Mm -hmm. uh, they get we are, of course, right? Yes, sir. Uh, are they permanently installed, or are you talking about devices which just, just for certain purposes installed and they move them? Like with this oil, you're just feeding this oil to the device, or is permanently locked? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I will answer that yes, uh, because there's a couple different answers to that. Is one, in devices like the Pump MD, we would prefer to be like a set it and forget it. Like never take it out, because we want that steady, even a fluid MD with a nuclear company. Don't move it because we like it is going to be important to establish those machine learning cycles, that data. We want that thing running on there as much as possible, getting as much information off of that device as possible. Uh, now, interestingly enough, the eStat, it's a mobile unit. So you can actually you wheel it around from cart to cart or from you know from injection molding machine to injection molding machine and get the information off of there. So it can be both. Uh, but realistically in our world, uh, that even if we solve the problem, we believe the device should stay because we want that complete flywheel effect. Even if you take a filter out, put a new filter in, we want to watch that trend and we want them to watch that trend of, you know, if filter A only lasted you 80 days and filter B lasted you 180 days, why is that? And what's all the other layering data that you need to know? Devices which do uh, break food. They also have uh, obvious weakness. Uh, I'm talking about security. Uh, if the device which can go moisture into the device, they will be accessed uh, maliciously. Uh, An email the electronic version. They will be accessed maliciously. Uh, Absolutely. So to shrink the tax surfaces, maybe we need to. Uh, run it and, uh, and shut it down and uh, if it continues to run, how do you deal with this? What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, absolutely. We don't believe in security. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So we, uh, we're, you know, we do top line TLS encryption. Uh, we do OTA firmware updates so we can obviously update new security patches as we do on our devices. But you do, you do this, and that's what uh, you do this for, uh, let's say, a this device. I put it in continuously running a, or I do this mm -hmm. updates, or you push it with updates. How 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 do you do this push? This one, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we we push, uh, but honestly, it's a lot of one to one with that customer because you're exactly right. We can't, you know, just like your your smartphone, you just get a random notification that you have a new a new thing to download, right? Uh, we can't afford to send a push. We can't do a security patch in the middle of production. You know, so there's a tremendous interfacing that has to happen. Okay, well, let us know on your next downtime cycle that we can update our patch, unless it's a you know mission critical type of security patch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are all these devices hardwired so they can make, make data, or they're wireless? Uh, both angles. Uh, in in 2019's IoT, we can't afford to go completely wireless. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we basically do. Um, multi levels of connectivity, so some devices can hardline right into a PLC still for IoT like is what we call it, you know, and then you can get into you know, Ethernet as well, and then we do have cellular and Wi Fi as well. Um, is this a good time to, uh, yeah, to, to, to take a break? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you.
pause that? Yeah. Okay. Is everyone tracking so far? Is this? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank, Thank you. So, Please. real quick announcement about the food. Limit to two slices on your first visit. We did get dessert. Limit to or so range. Um, so. Yeah, we were like, I'm surprised one of these pumps haven't actually like exploded um, at this point with all the stuff that they were running through there. And as you can do with IoT and some training data, guess what? The day that it registered, you know, pretty much we put this on, a couple hours later it registered that 85 PSI, four days later, here's your knee, pump that, right? So for them, this would have been another time to replace another shaft seal. <laughs> they said, well, time out, you know, there's actually bigger problems that you're that you're looking at here and 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 so where this actually again from an industrial standpoint where iot becomes a great use case for them is for the maintenance technicians and the reliability engineers and all that like just because something breaks they have to go on this big mitigation journey right what's going on you know and then and their their time is strapped i mean everyone's you know cutting staff and cutting costs and all that so they've got a million other things to work on and now I've got to go like try and figure out what's going on. So I am going to go and solve whatever the problem is right in front of me, which is the shaft seal. So I'm just, that buys me another maybe month of operation before I'm going to have to replace it again um, because there's just too much to look at. But by having, you know, by looking at pressure, temperature, flows, and all that kind of stuff inside the internals of the pump, you know, we said, okay, well, wait, there's, a, there's actually a blockage in the case line. That's what's, that's what's going on here. Uh, or potentially your, your case line is actually undersized. So again, what I was talking about with the, the filter guy, your, your whole baseline of your filtration was wrong. That's where your problem is. And here, maybe again, you've got the wrong pumps. Like that's why this is happening, is for the operations that you need, at some point, someone basically gave you the wrong, so they spec you out the wrong size pump. And within, within like, that was like an hour phone call, basically pulled them away from solving this problem mode to actually solving the true problem uh, and then, you know, the, the big cost savings for them is now, you know, they were spending upwards of, you know, 50, 60K on shaft seals constantly. And now, getting them actually the right pumps, they're going to experience all that cost savings uh, moving, moving forward from there. Uh, I think this will be one you all appreciate as well. We'll call this one solving the user error problem. Um, so one, one big company in particular uh, is working with us because 90% of their repairs are from poor installation. So they create a certain industrial asset that goes into the market. It's a, high, it's a very high use, high frequency type of device. And for the life of them, you know, it's one of those because it, it gets into motion control. Uh, the actual installation profile is very important. And, you know, I, I hate it, but the, you know, we live in a, in a world where you, know, you get instructions and it's just another person's opinion, right? So those go out the door. And, uh, you know, you just kind of do your thing and you're, and you're off, or they get a contractor that comes in and, and installs it for them. Uh, and then, you know, within, sure enough, within six months, a year, you know, they're calling up or, or a year and a half and they're saying, hey, this thing's already broken, what's, what's going on? And this is like the premium of this asset supplier in, in the global marketplace. Um, so we're working with them on a project via IoT that would actually inhibit startup until the right sensing profile was there on a baseline installation. Uh, so basically you couldn't even start up the system, but you know, but that's more of a kind of a midterm milestone. The first term milestone is just by gathering the right information off there via the vibration profiles and ice oscillations and everything like that. Uh, it just opens up that feedback loop between that OEM, their contractors and the end user. Um, because now, you know, it gives them not only more intelligence on maybe how they can, you know, design better devices in the future, but honestly it protects them in the warranty game, right? You know, so we've had a couple of customers that we've worked with that, you know, a, a piece of equipment goes down and they get in a big finger pointing match of who's, who's responsible, who's liable, and we've seen at least in the last 18 months that when those go to court, this kind of stuff actually becomes really important. But what, what does the data say? Because then we have a day associated with it, we have a trend on when the failure happened, and we can actually get into that. So a lot of companies, OEM specifically, I'm glad you brought up the FDA, because the FDA is involved with one of our partners uh, on uh, a chemical that gets shot into the soil, uh, and they have a certain chemical 
that can only be used and sometimes contractors love to sneak and try and do it themselves instead of the actual set contractor who's supposed to do it. Now the FDA gets a note, a notification every time someone sees out of the random. So they can go and follow up and, and pursue that uh, for, for our liabilities sake. Because I don't know yeah, that you the sensors in the ground though. Well the sensor is actually in the device that injects, so they would know about the mix that's in the injector and what the actual tool is that's using it. It's what's putting the, the information there for them. Uh, and the, this is the same same company for that has another application with uh, mines. So the trucks that come in with all the explosive materials to do, you know, to blow out mines and all that kind of stuff. Um, they've, you know, since 9-11, there's been a big push to get as much data into that process as possible. Why is this truck, you know, with all this material, you know, uh, explosive material on here, why is it parked for more than 30 seconds at a time? Like it should never be parked for, you know, all this kind of stuff. So through telemetry data and all that kind of stuff, there's someone always kind of watching you know, from a, from a liability uh, warranty and, and risk standpoint as well. Um, I won't go through all of these, but you know, these are just some other ways that there's, you know, right cases for ROI uh, when it comes to how we're using it. Uh, again, as I mentioned from the very beginning, I, I brush up really harshly against people out there saying they're doing predictive analytics today. Consumer IoT, yes. Because uh, they have the billions of pieces of data that they can actually, you know, to some degree, they don't always get it right. And the one that always cracks me up is when my wife and I watch Hulu together. There's always an advertisement for Match.com. And I'm like, you got your audience wrong, you know. Uh, unless they've got predictive analytics, and then I'm going to have to have a talk with my wife uh, at this point. But, um, you know, but the... But the reality is, you know, so we talk about context, contextual maintenance. And that's really where we, we shine, where we try and push the industry toward right now is what's all the base layers, the layering of information that's actually painting a better picture around, you know, pressures in your pumps and, you know, amount of chemical that's being injected into the ground and then all the different use cases that we're talking about here. Talk about the operation profile. Um, talk about the proven baselines, the regulations. Uh, you know, one that we're starting to see a lot more of is the, especially from the global manufacturers, is how they harmonize production processes, right? You know, that if sometimes it's a product, similar products that are being made across different sites around the world or uh, around the country, uh, IoT enables you to start finding the right baseline of how to, how to create a product with, uh, with, you know, low, low levels, or practically no levels of variance. Uh, we started to look at end of arm tooling inventory improvements. You know, so in your CNC and your automation and all that, there's some type of end-of-arm tool there. And there's some type of inventory for those when you put change and all that. Uh, well, we can start getting into now with machine-to-machine -machine communication where that, you know, end-of-arm tool is smart enough to talk to the local ERP system that can basically know via Kanban, you know, hey, there's only three of these, uh, you know, grippers left in inventory and, you know, the average gripper life is, you know, maybe uh, 2,000 cycles. So when we get to, you know, this certain level, it just triggers the next order to come in for that, which is really cool. Huh? Okay. That can show the couple of issues. Nope. Just a little, with, with, uh, this kind of business, uh, how uh, is there is there any way um, for for your company, your journey, uh, to predict uh, return on investment? Uh, not not just actual effect, uh, which we can estimate easily. Uh, do you do this analysis, predictive analysis, as far as potential return on investment? Like how close you can get? Uh, to what it will be yeah. after, after, after. There's a, remind me, send me an email. There's a fascinating 40 page or so dissertation on what's called agency-based modeling for ROI. And it's basically how to create an ROI algorithm when you don't know the future. Um, and it's really fascinating stuff to sit behind that. You know, I mean, that's some of the questions we get asked. Well, how do I know that you know, I'm gonna get a return on investment on this? And in the very short term, the whole concept of ROI has had to change a little bit. You know, so one of our customers, they're like, hey, we're ready to spend seven figures on doing this, but how do we know that that's a worthwhile investment? And I'm like, well, you're, you're not gonna know that today unless you're willing to give me maybe $20,000 today to then do the use case to prove out that ROI. 
You know, so there needs to be now more of it. Instead of showing up and saying, okay, okay I'm immediately going to bring you this value, I need you to invest 5,000, 8,000, 1,000, 10,000, whatever their palette is for, for a nice set term proof of concept phase and then vet out. You know, because if you can do a proof of concept for three months, six months, you can then start to, if you've got the right cycles, cycle time associated there, you can then start to project, project that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I think we will. I believe you. Yeah. I should have some things to make some yeah. plans. And it's it's dense, but it's I think we're gonna have to get more into that. You know, how do you how do you create an ROI when you don't know the future? You know, because uh, I know we have to do a lot of that geopolitics and population growth and all that kind of stuff when you're you gotta have some type of prediction, right? Based on uncertain future. So how do you how do you get through there? Yeah, let alone in some cases the ROI doesn't mean that much because those uh, security or operation uh, involved operational needs may be right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so then we have started to see, uh, even with our ESTAP product, you know, the, tra the transition into this is the only futurist that I'll get uh, in this talk is getting into like IoT 2.0, which technically IoT 2.0 is getting more to actuation, right? So based on some information, another machine is making some type of actuation protocol. We're going to see a lot more of this in motion controls. Uh, we're getting super low latency type of applications where someone's telling something else. Uh, you know, there's, this happens offline a lot already. I'm just kind of bringing that online. Uh, talk about energy and IoT is another great opportunity we're using to make it visible. visible. So things like compressed air, uh, you know, energy modeling, light, all sorts of those kind of things. Uh, based on the time, I'm going to skip the next slide because I'm pretty much just beating, uh, beating it in at this point. Um, yeah, same with this one too, actually, answering a few questions I got into this. Okay, so now we want to make, in the final 15-ish, 20 minutes here, uh, the presentation-wise, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make that pivot toward IT, okay? And I, I very cautiously do that. I ask for your grace because again, I'm not an IT person. Uh, but let's, uh, you know, I kind of give you more like our approaches and philosophies behind it, okay? And our approach and our philosophy, and I, I talk to a lot of, again, more like executive level, corporate level people, and I tell them that they need to find their laws, okay? So we have, we have laws. Lars is a guy on our team, right? Uh, and, and Lars is really one of the uh, one of the main reasons that we've been able to have uh, pretty good success in short order. Okay, because Lars is in, in the industrial space. Because Lars is perfect harmony of you know he's a mechanical guy by trade, mechanical engineer. Um, he's European, but I'm not sure that matters a whole lot uh, other than optics when we're talking to the European companies. Uh, that wouldn't be a mandate. Uh, but he has spent his last. You know, almost reminds me a little bit of you, John. You know, so he engineer for 15, 20 years, and then he's been in IT for the last 15, 20 years. You know, so he was the CTO actually of my parent company, and then came over. But you know, so he's got that whole idea of he knows the installation environment, he knows the application environment, and then he can also hang in there and with the uh, with the IT level conversations as well. You know, so I just basically would encourage uh, you know for for other people's IT departments that get easily overwhelmed, um, that easily get overwhelmed with, uh, you know, IoT requests from corporate and everything of the sort that, uh, you know, I coach them on how do they find their LARs, you know. Um, I'm trying to press that so quickly this time. Okay. Yeah, so basically we'll just tell them, you know, there, there are Lars's out there, we run into them all the time, you know, how do they how do they find that right talent stack? Uh, and then actually get them into, again, very high level, but know, know their tech stack. I don't want any CEOs out there knowing the tech stack. But they need to have people in their atmosphere, in their arena that knows the difference between cloud providers, brokers, what is MQTT, what is OPC UA, should I use Kofi-Net? Should I use Ethernet IP? Should I use TCP IP? Um, what am I doing with the data? Uh, how many times am I data in the network? What other protocols am I using? Um, and there are, again, there are great companies out there to do this kind of stuff. But I think, unfortunately, what happens is, uh, and for all of you in here that are in some capacity in IT, I, I empathize with you that you know, we were signing on one of our channel partners, uh, really big, they cover, you know, 
16 states in the U.S. And we were telling them about our visualization experience and all that. The guy's kind of a, uh, kind of a jerk. Uh, he's a great business guy, but you know, not always the most uh, socially uh, easy to talk to. And he's just like, well, you know, he's like, well, I'll just have Larry and IT do all this for me. <laughs> and I, I couldn't help but laugh. Thank you. I thought I did the same thing. I couldn't help but laugh. You know, I was just like, <coughs> and, and, I, and, I, and it wasn't that like Larry doesn't have the skill set to, to do that. Do you realize all the other crap that he's doing right now? Like, it's not like he was like, oh, hey, Larry, this afternoon, can you build a whole back end architecture for me? And, you know, how it works and secure it and everything like that. And I, I the guy's in his cabin, I was like, Kevin, and I feel bad for Larry. I was like, Kevin, you know what? Go and try that and let me know how that goes. Or, you know, good, good luck. Uh, but that's just, that's why I feel bad for all of the IT professionals because the corporate level executives are like, oh, yeah, we can do all, we can do anything. You know, I'll, just have, I'll just have IT do it. No, uh, you know, so we again try to get, uh, you know, get organizations and corporations that we work with to get ready to win the interrogation. Um, can I ask what yeah. database you use the most? Yeah, so we probably use AWS, uh, AWS the most, but we are getting more into Azure. Well, there's a cloud, but what database system? So we pull down from there's a, there's a local one that we use called Scanty, S-C-A-N-T-E. That would be an interesting one to look at. Um, but yeah. So we, uh, from a, you know, we continue to encourage our, our partners to basically win the interrogation, right? And all I mean by that is, and I'm thankful that this is happening, you know, because we've experienced, so when we first came on the scene in, in 2017, you know, we would go, Custom, depending on the customer, but some customers we would go to and be like, hey, we want to put this device in your network. They're, Great. Uh, username is team, password is 0000. zero, zero, zero. It's like, great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, to now, you know, and, and even though that was great then to get some products out and running and all that kind of stuff, but now, you know, it is, it is a challenge, as it should be in these early stages to get, you know, big kind of device build out onto, onto a network. Um, and all the right questions are being asked. I was telling you guys about the, the nuclear application. I mean, there's, there's literally was a process for everything. There was a cloud committee. There was, you know, an installation committee, a data distribution committee, uh, and everything that goes along with that. Um, but what's nice is that as things are getting more kind of process-driven with IoT installations, uh, the questions, kind of the same questions keep coming up. You know, okay, well, who owns the data in this transaction? Where's the data going to be stored? You know, the one that we see a lot, and I'll get back to is, okay, well, can you work inside my disk? And whether that's the local CNNS, you know, or the local cloud, or they've already got someone else in there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And fortunately for all of you in here in IT, when I get out and I talk to corporate level executives, I just hold this slide up here for, you know, a good minute or two and just let that sink in for them because, especially in the hydraulic space, they're just still so lax when it comes to IT security and what that means for them. You know, it's still an afterthought and it drives us nuts. Uh, you know, but it's, you know, uh, one of our, actually one of our channel partners um, had a $750,000 ransomware attack Ooh. last year. Um, yeah. And he said, all right. Well, you made you feel a little bit. It's not only in, in, in the middle space. It's all over. <laughs> yeah, right. right. So, and cybersecurity is the uh, of this country is absolutely important. Yeah. Yes. It is the thing that can stay Right. And then, and so for us, you know, we, we again, we try and get out and educate because there's just a lot of, like, they just don't know what they don't know, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, for us, uh, you know, we tell them stories of, like, okay, you know, because we'll still get, especially even at the end user level, where look at these, like, really high profile facilities, and they'll be like, well, I'll just go on Amazon and give me, like, a nanny cam or a webcam and put it on my machine. And it's like, do you read? <laughs> that's, that's a terrible idea. Uh, you know, the one that was actually in the news just a, a couple of months ago was, uh, you know, kind of off the shelf smart light bulbs. People were able to go and retrieve them out of a trash, a trash bin, unscrew the light bulb, tap into the PCB, and basically have unencrypted access to the former password, all the information, network profiles of whoever used it beforehand. And you wouldn't even have to pull out the trash can to do it. You could literally just go up and take it off and take it with you. 
or if you're a secondhand buyer, you know, if you're buying stuff, you know, it's just like people just don't understand. They just think like, oh, well, I just made a cam and went bad. I'm just gonna throw it away. You know, no, that that doesn't work that way. Like that's a that's a security a security nightmare. Uh, it's, it's actually not part of the physical security arrangement in many organizations. Uh, how they uh, install control and schools. Uh, for example, this small boat. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, absolutely. So, without organization, what part of the organization is now dealing with this situation? Yeah. Um, have you worked with any thermometers in a fish tank? We have uh, thermometers in a fish tank uh, at this point. But I imagine mean, smart, smart thermometers in a fish tank is probably also. Uh, Do you know why I said that? In, in uh, Las Vegas, a casino uh, lost a database through the um, thermometer through the fish tank. Of course they did. Through <laughs> <laughs> the what? Thermometer on a fish tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a thermometer or a pump, I don't know, it was on the fish tank. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so for us, we, uh, you know, us and our parent company, we use a program called Dark Trace which I would highly encourage <coughs> Jan working with you, Keith, RIT person on our team. I, I, I use it. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Dark, Dark Trace is, I wish I could spend a whole separate presentation on Dark Trace. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, I can only give you like in short, but it basically is just an AI driven force multiplication. So it basically casts a wide net uh, across your organization where good actors or bad actors, if they're new, Dark Trace is getting notified. Every new entrant because, uh, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you experience this as well, my parent company, so at our facility, we have 125 people on site. And we deployed this, we found that we had 125 people on site and 937 devices. Wow. I mean, because that's just the nature of today, right? Everyone's got a, a smart watch, a smart phone, a tablet, a couple of laptops, connected TVs, everything. You know, and, and who's managing all that kind of stuff? And that's where, you know, for us, for Keith, thank goodness, for Keith is such a rock star, uh, you know, and, and all that. But it enables him to, you know, have that kind of, you know, our IT department is, is four people. And this has literally caught, in the last six months, caught three zero-day attacks, uh, one man-in-the-middle attack. I mean, it's just like on it. And of course, there's a, there's a ton of like, okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. The, the irony is that Keith and Lars, my Lars, they're like this, because Lars is a nightmare for Keith with Dark Trace, because Lars always has new stuff on the network and he's messing around with everything. And Lars is good, but you know, Dark Trace is just saying, I don't care, you're just, you're just new. And I would rather take the take the risk of annoying Keith in IT than to say, hey, you're fine. And a really great case example of this is we had a, a trainer come in about three months ago to train hydraulics. He came in, and I wish I could show you a picture, but there's too much internal stuff to my team that was on there, but immediately when he hooked up his laptop to the network, he suddenly, through some virus he had on his program, had access to like 600 devices on our network, immediately, as a route into our network. And like, Dark Trace was like, hey, hey, so, like, so you can imagine Keith, hair on fire, like, jumps in and like shuts down the presentation. He's like, no, like, we, you know, like that thing's got to get off the network now because there was a, an insurance through, I think it was like Wang Zhao in China, had suddenly just like through this guy's laptop had entered into our network in the middle of the presentation. You know, so imagine like that guy was going to be there all day doing a presentation and that would have just been a like field day for whoever is through this guy's laptop into, into our network. Um, so they do, uh, as an FYI, uh, feel free to reach out to me. They do uh, free trials of this stuff. And it literally took me 10 minutes into a free trial with them to A, never do anything besides check the email work ever again. Uh, you know, if it's like first initial, last name, went here, did this, downloaded this, does this, uh, which is going to get some need at this point. Um, but it just, it's just, it's a really cool user face. It's amazing. It's amazing. It really is. It's cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So final couple of slides here. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, what's been, what we have seen has been a great shift in the IoT space is, you know, three, two, three years ago, all the big players came in and they want to do the whole vendor lock-in thing, right? So like, hey, I'm doing cool stuff, but in order to do my cool stuff, you've got to use my database, my cloud, my architecture, and all that. And you're like, okay, great, but can you do this over here? Well, no. Okay. Well, now I've got to use your silo, your silo, your silo, and it was uh, it was very telling for us. We were working with uh, Tiss and Crow, and they had some people come in. They're like, "We love your stuff. God help me if you tell us to download another app, we're out. Like we just don't want another app 
on our phone at this point, you know. Um, and what's been great is it shifted where now, as I was getting with on the interrogation slide, is now we go in and the customer says, hey, we love what you're doing, but can it do this? Can it jump on this? Can it be this? Can it talk this way? Can it do that? And that's just, that's when that prudent phase, all the way back to the beginning, right? And that's where we have to show up and say, yeah, it can, it can do that. It can't do that yet, but if it's really important to you, like we can make that kind of pivot. So it's been really powerful and empowering, it seems like for IT departments, OT departments to really get uh, that, that level of power and authority back and to say, you know, hey, we actually need you to work with us on this rather than the, uh, the other way around. Um, and then of course, you know, just kind of wrap up things here, we know that there's, there's more road, roadblocks and opportunities when it comes to IoT, especially in the industrial space. Uh, and one that, that, you know, that has continued to bother me a bit more that I'm just keeping an eye on um, is one, I actually heard a guy from Amazon say that their new program is unhackable, which I was like, oh, don't say that in public. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't. Hey, I was, out, I was out of automate, and one of their head people was out there saying that their new green space, which they use for robotic automation, is, uh, is unhackable. And I was just like, oh, geez. yeah. Everyone, I think everyone was like, oh. Um, so you still have that, those kind of shenanigans going on out there. But two, frankly, I'm, I'm honestly most worried around what consumer-based IoT and technology is doing to everybody. Uh, and I'll jump on a soapbox and then jump, jump back off here pretty quickly to the point of just, you know, they're calling it the digital mindfulness movement, right? Where people are just, you know, like my wife and I, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like for us. Like when we come home from work, like we had a little bin drop your phones in, like just to like be present, but like works really crazy right now. So like, even if I put my phone in the bin, I'm still thinking about it in the next room over and you know, maybe I have to pee a couple more extra times that night just so I can walk by and, and check and all that kind of stuff. But uh, but it's gotten so bad for a lot of people that, and this, I'm not making this up, there's a, there's a program or an app that recently came out called Enough Phone is Enough, where literally you pay three hundredths of a cent every time you pick up your phone. <coughs> Hello Capitalism. Someone was like, hey, you know they already pay for that cell phone and they already pay cellular service for it. Let's actually make them pay to use it again uh, as, a, as a downfall of them already using their phone too much. You know, and people are actually subscribing to it. Like, I will, I will take a financial penalty myself for how many times I pick up the phone. Uh, and in some ways, like, I'm, I'm actually for finding more balance with technology and what its influences are and how it affects our attention span and the ability to like read a long form article today seems a lot harder uh, than, it, than it has been. I mean, getting through that 30 page thing on agency based modeling was like a, a challenge for me. And it's like, why is it so hard to read 30 pages now? Uh, but I think where, coming from the industrial side where I'm concerned, is what happens if that becomes a more sweeping movement? And I'm trying to tell someone that their machine is down and they're paying every time they pick up their phone. Uh, because you know everything just becomes more continuous. No one really wants to walk around with two, three phones, based on that. So you know more people just has it set up on their on their phone type of device. But you know what happens where you know where technology is actually really beneficial on preventing downtime and, and utility management and you know medical all that kind of stuff. But the consumer IoT side has gotten so reckless uh, with you know connected fridges and mirrors and you know dog food bowls and everything that you can think of connected and sending you messages that people are just like ah hard pendulum swing you know i want to go back to just well, the way it was and that's that's really bad for industries that, that actually really need this good data to to make a, a big change uh, as it as it moves forward so uh, so in addition to all these things like setting proper expectations playing nicely in the sandbox all the multivariate you know ways to connect uh, obviously security and just the time, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's long, long lead, you know, no one's just saying, hey, okay, yeah, I like that, let's get on the network, let's go, you know, it's a, there's a committee now, there's a process around it, everything like that. Um, so, uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, again, I, I hope my talk with you tonight showed that, again, in the pockets of industrial optimization, IoT is happening, and we're doing it really well, and it's, it's fun, and all that. Uh, Industry 4.0 in and of itself is a really long uphill battle still, uh, age, because again, there's a, there's a big fragmentation between corporate level that wants to do it, loves it, gets behind it, and then they say go, and then that trickle down just gets all sort of messed up between 
you know, again, the engineers on their side, they need uptime. So, uh, so security is second, second fiddle to them. And that's on, it's being generous. You know, they're just like, I just need to know that, you know, my machine's up, so I'll do whatever it takes. You know, we have a couple of companies that we're working with, they're like, okay, we're gonna do all this off the books, because we don't want corporate to know what we're doing, but we gotta, you know, we gotta get this stuff up and running. You know, and then IT departments are over here wanting to pull the hair out, they're just like, ah, oh, you know, what, why are we doing this? What, is, what, is, what even is this? Uh, you know, there's, so there's all this need for, you know, a more harmonious, uh, harmonious approach, which again, we're, we're seeing, uh, it's, it seems to be going more positive at this point than negative. So uh, for those of you in IT, please know that I'm out talking to other corporations and executives, telling them this story, getting them involved, under, helping them understand a little bit more around all that it takes from an IT, OT side to actually get on the other side of that cat's that I was talking about before. So appreciate your guys' time. <laughs> Still the cost, but a cheaper cost. A few years ago, five, ten years ago, everybody was putting like a cellular phone at monitoring stations. It, is it well? Is your solution cheaper? And is anybody doing that? Trying to instead of putting cell phones there, actually putting your monitoring devices? Yeah, absolutely. That, absolutely, that's happening. Um, the, the challenge becomes just using cellular as an example. Yeah. Is in a, literally in a span of a week, we had one of our big customers say, we want to go cellular on everything. And another customer, big German customer said, cellular was just outlawed across all facilities mm -hmm. for device monitoring. Wow. You know, so literally in, in a span of a week, this complete polar opposite on approaches to cellular, right? Um, but Yeah, I have a couple of plans where uh, cell phone communication work completely in the natural yeah. language. Like, yeah. like, yeah. There is no cloud. No, right. no, it's not allowed. It's against both. It's against both. Yeah. Company policy. You have any say, serial of communication in the living country. Living in the country. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cost perspective, are your solutions, would they be any cheaper than using cellular devices? But they would be. Okay. Yeah. They would be. Yeah, because you know the reality is, I mean, there's there's so many you guys you guys there's so many nuances that I could have gotten in here tonight. I mean, I didn't even talk about edge and fog and cloud and there's all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, in fact, I think it was even just this week that there's a new like a whole um, I can't think of the company's name now, but there's a whole like edge ecosystem that's basically coming out uh, pretty soon. And then you know, but then for people who are really hard on edge, uh, really good for edge. You know, then there's some people that says, well, 5G is basically going to wipe out Edge. Because the reason the Edge is there is for those low latency applications, motion controls, all that kind of stuff. And 5G will be fast enough that the Edge will just disappear. You know, that's that's the world that we're in, right? You know, so for vendors like us, you're always, you got your, you got your dancing shoes on every day. You know, and you're trying to say, okay, well, we can, can't do this, that, or the other. Um, do you have sensors put on drones? We do not. It's not to say that we couldn't uh, at this point, but um, you know, I, as I said, for me, and I, I, just coming back as a, as a we were came just a little bit late, but I like I'm a fit form function product guy, uh, so I'm also fiercely protective over you know kind of what we work on and what we don't. And again, I you know, drones is one of those things where I'm just like. I don't know if I want the liability of, of putting sensors on something that I can lose control of or uh, visual, you know, visual analysis and, and all that. I mean, that's, you know, go back to the mirror example. The, uh, the goofballs who designed that actually had it had a live feed in there. Like they, yeah, and I agree with you, Jeremy. It's, it's still great that it's not fully uh, effectively regulated. It's really right. better if you could adjust the regulations. So you, I, I understand why what you want uh, to do now uh, in the in the wrong scenario. Right. But my question, can you talk a little bit more about your company and where you got? Is it still private little company, really old company? Uh, how is structured? You said at one point uh, uh, only six people. You said. Uh, so <laughs> where and how you make devices? Can you just describe this? Whatever you think feel you should. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can share. Yeah. Uh, so again, we we came from a 50-year-old parent company called Hydrotech. 
uh, it's up in Westchester. Uh, so they did fluid power solutions, automation, all around the Midwest. Uh, so we started in 2017, privately held. Uh, so currently today's staff is, I'm vice president, which pretty much just means like I do a little bit of everything. Um, but I have people that do the good stuff really well, you know, so uh, I have Lars, our director of connectivity and security. Uh, I have a guy named Mike Hoskins, who's our director of IoT applications. So he's the one heading up our IoT clinic, going out there and saying, hey, what are you trying to look at? Uh, and then uh, I have a guy named Matt Lyle, who's our design engineer. So he's the one that's building all the, the products. And then we just hired a new guy um, who's basically our director of reliability solutions. So he's a class three vibration specialist. So there's four classes of vibration. Class four, there's like 50 people worldwide who doctorates. Uh, class three pretty much means you can diagnose any problem with vibration, like just based on the profiles and all that. We just know what's going on. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to do as a company, and we have Daniel uh, in, in marketing uh, as well, uh, brand. But you know, because it's my vision, and again, what we're winning is that you know we are we are basically creating a, a rush more of institutional knowledge when it comes to solving these problems, right? Where, again, we're not just doing dashboards, we're not just doing sensors, it's really in the use data piece. So by having people with 20 plus years of fluid filtration experience, by having people with 30 years of vibration experience, having people with 30 plus years of uh, condition monitoring and equipment maintenance, we can really come in. I mean, one of the big food and bed company in the area, they were like, we want you to come in. Uh, they had a couple of key machines that keep breaking down. They're like, we want you to come in, sense it up, visualize it, and monitor it. Now, historically, we go in and like, help them make inferences from their monitor, and I'm just like, you really are willing to pay someone from my team that we hourly rate out pretty expensively to just monitor your data. They're like, yeah, yeah, because we don't know what's going on, so we'd, we'd rather just have you guys do it. Uh, so the way that our business breaks down is, you know, we, we, have, we do product development. Uh, we go to market through channel, channel partners. Uh, we will never be logistics champions. I don't want to be a logistics champion, so I would rather have other people route my product for us uh, and all that. And then we do uh, custom engineering NRE. So a couple of customers have specific sensing packages that they want, uh, the installation problem issue, uh, use case I talked about, and then again, our own IoT clinic, which is turnkey, co basically consulting more NRE, you know, uh, hourly, hourly rates from there. Um, it's my goal that, you know, I, I would say we're probably on pace to be to double our staff this year. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, so we, we just signed on a couple of partners in New Zealand and Australia, uh, which is fun, because when you know, hey, if something happens there, who knows? And or you get to go to New Zealand and Australia to go and, and do some troubleshooting and, and some maintenance. Uh, but based here at Westchester, uh, again, I brought a couple products, my business cards, and you know, encourage you to follow up with me if you got more questions. Um, you know, who owns? So we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Hydrotech. So, yeah. So, it, so what, what's great about that is, so of course, you know, if you guys are doing the math in here, you're like, ah, six people can't do all that. Of course we can't, right? You know. So for us, what's nice is being a pseudo a pseudo startup is we basically get to spend ninety percent of our time in ideation mode and designing things and solving problems and all that. And we still lean on our parent company for all the red tape and bureaucracy. So like we still leverage their company for HR, IT support. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our own marketing uh, in, internal, and Daniel does a great job uh, on that. Uh, but shipping and receiving, you know, we have access to, uh, gosh, probably a 20,000 square foot warehouse space just for us that we can do all of our equipment testing in and manufacturing and everything uh, of the sort. And then we have a couple of really strategic partners that we leverage as well. Yeah. Okay, now, it, everything you've been talking about and have talked about it has been fluid oriented. Yep. IoT diagnostics, do you do any other like round uh, analysis, any other sorts of air, air analysis, other types of things besides fluid? Absolutely. And the other question I have is how much fluid can you do at one time? For instance, can you run a water treatment plant? Absolutely. Or is it just the hydraulic fluid between servos and the lens? Yes, high, high volume, high capacity. Basically, it just boils down to the right sensor profile for that. And how long does it take to 
create that profile? In other words, how long does it have to be on site to do the analysis? Depends on how healthy your baseline is and where you're establishing your baseline. If you're, do, if you're establishing your baseline at the plant, depending on the size, it can take anywhere from a day to a week. Um, you know, if you have a healthy baseline going into it, then you, you have a baseline when you start. So for instance, like our fluid, our fluid, not to go back to hydraulic fluid, but our fluid in the, you know, at the nuclear site, we have them send us a sample, you know, of basically a 55 gallon drum, you know, of their fluid so we can sell the baseline so that way when we got there, because it is a nightmare to do anything in a nuclear facility, as you guys can imagine. Mm -hmm. You don't want to spend any time doing anything other than just getting in there, getting it set up and go. Like, you, we got there at 6 a.m. to do an installation of 11. Because that's how long it took to like get through all the stuff to then get down there to get it done. On, on the nuclear facilities, do you have the ability to, um, oh, what was that? The, um, Oh, I forget what it's called. Um, Chernobyl. Yeah, no, not Chernobyl. Uh, to do the the forward motion and the backward motion, would you would you have been able to detect? Um, if it's bi-directional stuff, we do that already. Like bi-directional servos and bi-directional valves and you know motion, you know anything motion control. Well, it was it was in the software. It made the, okay. the a part go fast one way and then fast the other way, mm -hmm. and it wasn't supposed to do that. Talk about centrifuges. Yeah, centrifuges. Yeah, that's I, we're not monitoring today, but it, it can be monitored for sure. Um, you know, so again, that's why we that's why we invented that dock device that said it fits pretty much. We can really be like if there's a zero to ten, four to twenty, zero to twenty four digital sensor. We can plug it in through there, get the information out of it. Uh, so we have 12 global sensing partners. Again, I don't want my company to create sensors. It's a nightmare journey. You know, there's just a lot around tolerance. Just taking the data from sensors that are already there. The, our, our core competencies is how, again, I go back to that exploded out hamburger, right? It's how to weave through that institutional knowledge, know how to layer the right sensors together to get the, the nice, the mix to say, okay, now we can get things like an evaporation curve. The sensor itself can tell you water via all this stuff, we can tell you how it evaporates. And that's where people are like, oh, I like that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.